In part one of our interview with Dan Healy, he explained the genesis of the Dead's legendary 1970s system, the Wall of Sound. This month, Dan tells of an early system blowout. You mentioned Mabel's Pavilion. I think that's probably a great anecdote of a, of a little incident that happened along the days of the development of the Wall of Sound system. Uh, the actual event was, uh, I got new high-frequency speakers, these special custom-made high-frequency speakers. I didn't have an opportunity to test them. We had this show coming up in Mabel's Pavilion. I had the entire wall of sound developed except for the high frequency. So I got all these new high frequency speakers. We hooked them up and somehow I miscalculated the level, of the volume that was supposed to be coming out of them. And it was like a hundred times what the rest of the stuff was. So when we turned the sound system on, um, in about the first two seconds, we were also late getting going. so. We didn't really get a chance to fire it up and test it, you know. So then it was showtime, the band's there. Band comes out on the stage, turn on the sound system. First two or three notes, bam, blew out. It was like $20,000 worth of high frequency speakers, you know. Bam, and like in less than a minute, they were gone, you know. Whoa! And I thought, oh boy, this is it. You know, I was practically ready to go to the bridge and jump, you know. And um, I went backstage and I was really bummed out and discouraged after the show was over, you know. We played the show without any high frequencies. And um, so I walked in the dressing room and going, hey, What's the matter, Dan? What's the matter? I go, oh, man, you're not going to believe what just happened. And I ran it down, and I thought, boy, this is it, man. Everybody's just going to say, get out of here, you know. And I, it was amazing uh, as an example of, of the kind of support and understanding the Grateful Dead has for all kinds of research and, and modernization and modern thoughts and stuff. So basically, you didn't get fired over that. No, right? actually, <laughs> I, um, I was probably harder on myself than everybody was on me, you right. know. But um, it's an example of, of the cooperation, and it, it's a, an example of the conditions that, that could have only brought about the development of the sound system, I and mean, that kind of uh, that sensation of everybody working together. Could you kind of compare and contrast for us the, the sound quality and volume of the system that you have now compared to the, the monster sound system and the model system you used then? Well, uh, at best, the wall of sound system could do maybe three to 5,000 people session we have now can do 30,000 people. It weighs about the same. It takes up about the same amount of truck time, and it takes about the same amount of time to set it up. The truck space, I meant to say. So what that means is that we've got maybe four times the system for the same amount of time, expenditure, and weight moving around the country. Always experimenting with new sounds, Dan explained his surround sound effects and those wild other one vocals. What I'm doing is I'm hoping to be able to do, cultivate and develop uh, forms of psychoacoustic enhancement. In other words, instead of the sound just coming point blank out of the rear speakers, what usually comes out of them or what I'm designing to come out of them are, are uh, effects and byproducts of the sound that's coming out of the main system up front. And the object is to create a sensation of spatiality and uh, uh, along the lines of holographic concepts. In other words, I've got it now where I can develop a sound that appears to be in the middle of the room, even though the stage is at one end of the room. And not only that, but you can stand in the back of the room and it looks like it's in front of you, but then if you walk up by the stage, then it sounds like it's from behind you. So I've been pretty successful in devising uh, holographic effects. And I'm hoping to just cultivate that more and go farther into that. I, it's too tacky to be able to try to use uh, main points of audio through the rear speakers. It's, t it's tacky, but uh, what isn't tacky and what is pleasant is, is to be able to use just very subtle essences of uh, byproducts of effects and that I manipulate in terms of time and shape so that it, it, it can arrive and meet in the center of the room and create a holographic effect which is predicated on on extreme accuracy. In other words, the speakers have to be very well aligned and you have to manipulate it very carefully, otherwise the holographic effect goes out the window. To be able to perceive something as three-dimensional has to have very precise setup and very precise sound uh, arrivals and stuff. So that's what I'm using the rear stuff for, is to enhance the psychoacoustic effects of it. Make it more fun and more pleasant, but, but not necessarily obvious. Also, I noticed during some songs, um say during the other one you will enhance the vocals, Bobby's vocals in some way. What What's going on with that? Could you want to reveal any of your secrets there? Yeah. Uh, so th th that's one of the areas. There's, there's certain areas in the music that I just reserved the right to get off into the zone on, you know, and that's one of those songs that kind of lends itself to that. And the nature of the, the, of the lyric material in that song kind of suggests a kind of an ethereal setting. So I, I one night, uh, Candace, who's 
my uh, mentor in terms of lights. She's the greatest lighting director that ever walked the face of the earth as far as I'm concerned. And I think I'm probably not the only one that feels that way, but at any rate, her and I some nights will get on to a, off on a tangent together and she'll start do she'll throw something out, like she'll do something with the lights, you know, and she'll go, hey, check that, you know. And so then I'll take the sound system and I'll go, okay, dig this, you know, and I'll throw something out there. So that's, uh, with, with respect to the other one, that's, she's the one that actually got me started doing that. This one night, we just like, it just started happening. She started doing something, then I started doing something, then she did something, I did something. Pretty soon it had built into this whole incredible picture. And so, uh, while I try not to do the same thing twice in a row, um, I try not to have pat answers and I try not to have pre predetermined settings and stuff so that hopefully it doesn't sound the same each time. And there's so many, such a limitless set of things that you can try that you don't ever really have to do the same thing twice anyway. You, it's much more fun and much more sensible to just go on to other stuff, you know. So. Um, I stretch out, I stretch out, you know, but, but it's all in an endeavor to make it more fun. Next month, Dan tells us his view of the Deadhead Tapers.